Ah, je, juste un instant, je suis... Euh, C'est bon? OK. Hello, my name is Kate. I'm the coordinator of programs and services at the ALS Society of Quebec. It is uh, my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Anita Mehta, Director of Education and Knowledge Exchange at the Teresa Deller Palliative Care Residence. Dr. Mehta is a licensed psychotherapist and a registered nurse. Her master's and doctoral studies were in the area of palliative care and more specifically focused on the family dynamics at the end of life. Dr. Mehta worked with the Psychosocial Oncology Program at the MUHC from 2007 to 2019, where she worked with families and patients dealing with illness, life transitions, family trauma, loss and grief, role changes, distress, anxiety and depression. As well as working at the Teresa Deller Palliative Care Residence, Dr. Mehta also works at the Jewish General Hospital as a nurse care counselor and couple and family therapist. Dr. Mehta also has a practice where she sees and supports individuals, couples, and families. Thank you, Dr. Mehta, very much for being with us today, and I give you the floor. Hello. Yep, I'm here. Great. Good? Yes, we're great. Okay. Est-ce que quelqu'un, tout le monde peut m'entendre? Oui. Bonjour tout le monde. Désolé, ça va être en anglais aujourd'hui. Uh, my apologies for that. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to my talk today. Um, palliative care is something I am really passionate about. And so I hope you share some of my passion. You get some of the understanding of, uh, of what we're going to talk about today. If we could go to the next slide, I'm sorry, I have no control over, thank you. Um, so today what I hope that you all leave here with is some understanding of what palliative care is, not just the definition, but also the philosophy and what it means to be um, cared for in palliative care. I'd also like to talk a little bit about how specific, um, specifically palliative care can help with the ALS population. Often it's thought of just as oncology or for cancer patients. And I'd like to expand that vision a little bit today. I'm also a big believer in the concept of hope. And so I wanted to spend some time looking at hope in palliative care. And because I specialize in families and family members, I don't think I could have done the talk without looking at the implications of, um, of care for family members as well. And then of course, I'd like to open it up to some discussion. So let's start very generally uh, in terms of what palliative care is. And so because there's a lot of you, I guess we won't start with what you feel palliative care is, but I want to just start by stressing that palliative care is really about life. It's about looking at the quality of life that a person has and that the family has. And the other piece that's really important to palliative care is understanding symptom management. And that's tied to comfort care and trying as much as possible to make the patient and the family as comfortable as possible. The other thing that people often think is that palliative care is really reserved for the end of life. And that couldn't be more incorrect. Palliative care is a concept that we are trying really hard to introduce almost from diagnosis on. And that's because the key concepts of patient-centered care, family-centered care, symptom management, whole person care and hope are really central to palliative care. And by introducing it early on, it introduces the idea that such care is possible and that these concepts of symptom management and family support should be started right from the beginning of diagnosis. The other key piece of palliative care in terms of the definition is focusing on patient autonomy and on the patient's choice. And so this is another key aspect that we'll be talking about. And of course, communication is key. And what I mean by communication isn't just the dialogue between the healthcare team and the patient, but it's in the listening aspect, understanding choice, understanding decisions that patients make and that family members make as well. Sometimes we hit a challenge when we look at palliative care or we work in palliative care is that Death is seen as something scary and separate from the normal life cycle. And in palliative care, we really try to underline or emphasize the point that it's 
part of the normal process. And we really look at that normalization. The other key piece of palliative care, especially with a lot of the talk now on medical aid and dying, is that palliative care doesn't aim to hasten death. In other words, it doesn't speed things up, nor do we look at postponing death or trying to delay it. We really try to meet the patient and the family where they are and to follow the normal trajectory of care as much as possible. Symptom relief and suffering are often what people think of when they think of end of life. And so another key goal of palliative care is to prevent that, is to look at suffering and try to minimize, if not completely eliminate it from the care trajectory. And of course, another key aspect of palliative care is that the palliative care team becomes a supportive network for the patient and family. So what that means is we become a resource. If there are questions to be asked, misconceptions related to palliative care, then it really means that we are a resource and a team that the patient and the family can call upon to ask for support. So when people think of quality of life and you think of a chronic illness, that definition sometimes becomes really challenged. And so part of understanding how to support a patient at the end of life is understanding what quality of life means for them. And so part of what we try to do in palliative care is understanding how you want to live understanding what the key aspects are in your life, and then we work with you to make sure that we can enhance that. The last thing that I wanted to mention related to palliative care that is that it's very much a team approach. It's not one individual working with the patient and with the family, but we have a multidisciplinary team of, uh, of professionals, um, and that includes psychosocial care, um, from which I, uh, that's my main background, in looking at not just understanding what the physical aspects of your illness is, but looking at how much, um, in terms of the emotional, psychosocial, and the, um, the spiritual piece of your distress is related and palliative care aims to tailor up to all of that. And so in terms of the team, and, and I know most of you are probably already in, involved with team care, but the palliative care team is composed of a multi multitude of different disciplines. And I'll just highlight some of them here. Of course, there are physicians, um, there are nurses. We rely very heavily on volunteers as well social workers, counselors, and of course, spiritual aid, advise, aid advisors. So when you think of palliative care, it's not just a concept or a treatment at the end of life, it's actually a team of individuals who work very closely together to give you optimal care. Now, what I have here um, is a video. Um, I don't know if it's able, if you're able to pull that up. C'est uh, en anglais, so I do apologize. I don't know if you can translate that at the same time, but this video really in very simple terms, explains the concept of palliative care to give you a little bit of an understanding of what the philosophy and what the focus is. So I hope the share audio was um, was clicked and, and hopefully we'll be able to, to get a sense there. Oh. I'm not sure where to... Uh... Just click on the, um, in the middle. And if it doesn't work, we'll just keep going. Okay, I've tried both sides, it's not... Uh unfortunately okay. working. That's okay. We can go to the next slide and we'll go from there. Okay. So what I find most interesting is what people perceive as important in palliative care and what people perceive as important in active care. When I say active care, I mean not a chronic diagnosis. So someone's hospitalized and we ask them what's important. And what I think this slide does is it really surprises a lot of people. The priorities for people when cure is actually achievable are not different than for those that are diagnosed with a chronic illness. So what people say they need or what's important to them when a cure is achievable is living fully until death, is maintaining those relationships in their life that they feel are very important or key to them, is being able to live in their community or with their families, um, it, maintaining their quality of life for as long as possible. And of course, they always want to participate in activities that are meaningful to them. And when research was done at patients who had chronic illnesses and the same questions were asked, guess what? They said the exact same thing. What were their priorities? Well, living fully until death. They too wanted to maintain relationships with the people who loved them and who they loved. They wanted to stay at home and living in their community for as long as possible. And of course, they also wanted to participate in activities that are meaningful to them. And so the reason I find this slide so amazing is because I, I always hear someone at the end of the presentation saying, wow, I didn't realize that. That's, that's a bit surprising. But the goals of care 
are defined by what matters to the patient. And what matters to the patient is exactly the same if they're in active treatment um, with a foreseeable end to their illness, or if they have a chronic illness where the end might be a little bit different. The goals of care are exactly the same because what matters to the patient is exactly the same. And so in terms of the ALS population at the palliative care residents, we do indeed see a range of different um, diagnoses that come in. It is not just restricted to cancer. There are many different types of populations that we see ALS included. And so what I wanted to do here is to just take a little bit uh, of time to look at how palliative care can be introduced um, to, to patients living with your diagnosis. And the first key thing to, to mention about palliative care is, as I said earlier, it's not restricted to the end of life or to the end of your disease trajectory. And that palliative care is actually possible at any age um, and at any stage of the illness. And the other key piece to realize is it's not one or the other. It doesn't mean if you are introduced to palliative care that active care or active treatment stops. It actually means that it can happen simultaneously, that you can be in active treatment and receive palliative care and support at the same time. And that's really important for patients to understand and to know. The support related to advanced care planning and goals of life are related to palliative care. Sometimes it can be difficult to talk about advanced care planning. What would happen if? What are my wishes and my hopes if I can't communicate them anymore? And that very much speaks to the foundations of palliative care and understanding again, what patients and what families need. And Again, when we think of end of life, we think of distress. And we'll talk about uh, myths a little bit later or misconceptions of palliative care. But the truth is we're not just looking at physical distress or physical side effects. We're also looking at the psychosocial aspects. What are your worries? What are your concerns? What are your fears? And these are all things that we make sure we put on the table when we're looking at palliative care. The main goal and the bottom line is to make sure the patient is comfortable. Um, but tied to that, is to make sure the families are comfortable. Our belief is you cannot separate the family caregiver or the family from taking care of the patient. And so when I was looking through some of the research and even what I've seen clinically, is that depending on your diagnosis and particularly with ALS, patients who received palliative care at the same time they were receiving active care treatment actually fared a lot better in terms of longevity and reported a better quality of life. That's not to say that quality of life um, will be impacted or will be worse off if you don't receive palliative care. What it is suggesting is that the introduction of palliative care or being aware of it, and if you do receive it simultaneously, can actually be a strength in your course of treatment. So even given that, and the knowledge that palliative care can be helpful, many patients with ALS are not aware of that and don't take advantage of that. So the research actually shows that um, very few people talk about hospice or palliative care with an ALS diagnosis, sometimes uh, until it's too late. Uh, and one study showed that it was only about 36% of patients that actually said that they would be interested or wanted to explore what palliative care was. And one of the reasons is that the conversation isn't initiated. Family members or patients don't often say, tell me about palliative care. I'm interested in the concept. I'd like to know more. And so that's, that's a real reason why there is such a huge barrier. And so when is the right time to talk? And so this is really interesting. Physicians often, or, or nurses, whoever's working with the patient or is responsible for the care, will often wait for the patient or the family member to say something that they see is a flag or an opening, and then the physician will initiate the conversation. So they will wait for the family to open the door, to ask, what will happen or what are my options? And so in doing this, physicians in the healthcare team sometimes miss big red flags or the psychological or social distress or suffering that patients or family members are experiencing. Or what might happen is they don't initiate the conversation until they see patients in distress. So that means they wait until the symptoms are out of control or that patients and families are in extreme crises before they start the conversation. And we often feel that that's, that's too late. They may wait until there's a point of intervention or a change in the care trajectory. So that might mean for, for a patient with ALS, all of a sudden there's difficulty swallowing or they may need to talk about a feeding tube. Um, 
or there's changes in breathing patterns or, or further intervention or change in functioning or mobility. So any of these changes means a change for patient functioning. And it can also mean a change in how the patient or the family member sees the illness and sees the treatment for the illness. So at this point, often they will ask the physician, what does this mean? What are our options? What if I don't want a feeding tube? And when these questions arise, that might be the open door that the physician might take, but to keep in mind that they may not. And so it's really up to patients and families sometimes to ask the questions. These points that I put up on this slide, I actually feel are too late. This point is too late to ask about what palliative care is or to ask the questions that are meaningful related to your care. And that's where I go back to the philosophy of palliative care being introduced very early on almost at the point of diagnosis to say, we're giving you active treatment. Here are all the things that we can do. Let's talk about palliative care as well, which means let's talk about symptom management, what your family wants, what are your hopes? What are your goals of care? So that way active care and palliative care can actually happen simultaneously. The other thing I wanted to talk about are misconceptions of palliative care. Um, and I'm curious when people hear soin palliative, or palliative care. I, I don't know if I can generate some, or maybe in the chat, which I can't even see, but are there people who have thoughts of what palliative care means or what it is? And Pil, uh, you can put the mic on or you can put in the chat and then if someone could share with me if there's anything popping up, but what do people think of when you think of palliative care? No one's filling up the chat with the, no? Okay, then I'll continue. So, okay, that's right, Diane. So what popped up was that it's for when I'm dying. So really limited to the end of life. And thank you for, for putting that up. Yeah, même chose. Bendy, exactement. Okay, so ça c'est vraiment important parce que c'est pas limité. Um, pour la fin de la vie. C'est comment, sorry, I'm switching to French. I mean, it really starts at the beginning of your diagnosis because palliative care isn't just about end of life care. It's a philosophy of care that stresses comfort, patient centered care, family centered care, psychosocial issues, your psychological concerns, your distress, your emotional state, as well as your spiritual. And so waiting till the end of life is actually too late to introduce what the concept of palliative care is. In fact, we started to use the term now active palliative care because exactly for that reason, that people think at the end of life is the only time palliative care can come into play and it's the only time it's useful. And so what I hope you leave today's talk with is a re-understanding or a, a reconceptualization of what palliative care is and how important it is to understand the concept and ask about it almost from the point of diagnosis. So what you've all actually just wonderfully done is talked about the first, uh, or one of the key aspects of what palliative care is and what the misconception is, is palliative care is for death. In fact, some people actually think that it hastens death and that could not be farther from the, uh, from the truth. If you remember, I put up a slide that talked about it neither hastening death, making it any quicker or slowing it down. It actually follows the normal care trajectory. Um, so we will meet you where you are in terms of palliative care. And the other thing that people often think is cancer. Palliative care is reserved just for cancer patients. And, and the truth is for a long time, in terms of the care we provided, it had been. And palliative care was often, there wasn't even a unit for it, much less a residence for palliative care. And so people were being cared for at the end of life throughout the hospitals. And so we would be trying to provide end of life care and who was flagged the most, it was cancer patients. But as I said earlier, we see every diagnosis at the end stage of their illness at the palliative care residence, at least where I work. And so it's not limited just to cancer patients. And that's why I think this talk is so important today with the ALS population. And we've certainly seen uh, a number and I wish I had the statistics for you come through our palliative care residents because it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. The concept of palliative care, regardless of your diagnosis remain the same. And it's comfort care and family focused care. And it's in communication and listening to what your needs are so we can meet them. 
Another common myth, and this particularly may be striking because sometimes of the need of a, of a feeding tube in your population, but that people in palliative care who stop eating die of starvation. And so this is another common um, misconception of what palliative care is and how patients and families feel patients pass away at the end of life when they are in palliative care. And again, what's happening uh, is a physiological process and I won't go into the details, but at the end of life, the needs for, for food decrease because the energy that's expelled decreases. And so there is actually a really good physiological reason for why that happens that has nothing to do with palliative care. The other myth or misconception related to palliative care is that you have to be in a hospital to receive optimal palliative care. And more and more you're seeing that that's not the case. Um, myself coming from the palliative care residents, I think you'll have someone from St. Raphael speaking later, really speaks to the point that optimal end of life care can be given outside of a hospital. And home care services has increased tremendously for end of life to be able to put in the resources you need to choose where you want to spend your last days and where your family wants you to spend the last days. And so that's a really key aspect. Uh, and that goes right back to palliative care, identifying what your goals of care are, what matters to the patient. That slide said, staying in the community or being with their family as long as possible. And so if that's your goal of care, that becomes our goal of care. And that means you can still receive palliative care at home in a residence and of course in the hospital. So that's another misconception that I wanted to point out and make sure that everyone's aware of. This other idea related to palliative care that people have articulated is this idea of death and dying and that it's associated specifically for that and the distress related to having to disclose that. And I put a fact up here about children um, because I do a lot of work with children, um, anticipatory grief and bereavement, this idea that we need to protect children or we need to protect anyone from the fact that we're dying or that we're sick or that there's a chronic illness. And the research actually shows the opposite that people need a chance to be able to talk about what's going on. They need, a uh, they need a place to put their grief. They need to be able to say goodbye and to express what their thoughts and feelings are with the person who is sick. And so that's another myth related to palliative care that I wanted to make sure that I put on the table and that I address today is that sometimes we feel we're protecting, but we're actually hurting instead. So, we had talked, uh, had talked a little bit earlier about symptom management and one of the goals really being um, optimal control of symptoms when we look at palliative care. And so another misconception, and I'll just focus on pain as a symptom here, but that pain is a part of dying. And you can look at that and say that distress is a part of dying or suffering is a part of dying. And again, palliative care really wants, wants to make sure that doesn't happen. And I think we excel in the fact that we're able to look at the sources of suffering. And again, I underline the fact that it's not just physical. Suffering and pain can be physiologically directed, but there are a lot of our patients that have an emotional distress or, or a social distress in terms of what will happen to their family or feeling like a burden. All of these things translate into suffering. And so palliative care takes a step back and takes a look at all sources of distress and psychological pain and, does the, and plays a huge role in trying to eliminate that particular part from dying. So a misconception um, is really that pain is a part of dying and palliative care does its best to make sure that it's not. There's a lot of talk about medication and addiction and the fact that opioids, for, exa opioids, for example, can enhance death or make it quicker. And, and the truth is, it's so regimented and so carefully administered and monitored that addiction is not the issue. It becomes tolerance. Sometimes at the end of life, the need for more medication increases. And so what we do is we tailor the patient's care um, to make sure the patient is optimally comfortable. And so addiction is not something we see very often at the end of life in terms of, uh, in terms of another misconception of palliative care. And I, I did mention earlier that I'm a big believer in hope. And so another misconception sometimes is that if someone talks about palliative care, as you said in the chat, that it means I'm at the end of life. And it means that no one's looking after me, the care is not active and therefore my doctor's given up on me. And to have hope taken away can be very difficult. And so what I'll talk about in a few minutes is what hope means or what hope looks like in palliative care. But I just wanna put that on the table and clear up the misconception that hope is taken away 
when we look at palliative care. Finally, one that I think weighs very heavily, the misconception of palliative care related to, again, what patients want is I've let a family member down because they didn't pass away at home. And this is tied into um, more family members than patients. We do look at goals of care for patients and what they want, but we also look at goals of care for family members. And so if there is a disconnect, we make sure we talk about it earlier. In the grief work that I do with family members, I will often hear this one. I promised that he could pass away at home and it didn't happen. And so there is regret and sadness and guilt. And so the first thing I say with my therapist hat is, please don't promise. Don't make a promise that you're not sure you can keep. Talk about it, but always have a plan B. My hope is that you can stay at home as long as possible because that's what you want. If that doesn't happen, what can we do? And so just to keep it on the table, um, because caregiver, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but caregiver guilt and caregiver regret can be very heavy. And that's why we really encourage in palliative care communication, not just with the patient family and ourselves as healthcare professionals, but between the patient and the family so that it's on the table in terms of what you want, what you wanna talk about and what might be challenging. And so it's again, planning for the future, planning for what lies ahead and having a conversation about it instead of waiting till the end of life and saying all of a sudden, oh, let's look at what my needs and my wants are and then building a care plan at the end of life. So I think that again underlines how important it is to have the palliative care process happen simultaneously or parallel to active care. So I'm a big believer in hope and I don't know how this will translate, but this is my favorite poem um, or a section of it from Emily Dickinson who says, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings a tune without words and never stops at all. And for me, that last piece, never stops at all, is really important. And so if we look at the next slide or we look at what hope means, hope changes. Usually at the beginning of care, when I meet patients and family, the hope can be a hope for a cure, hope that things get better. Given an AL diagnosis, the trajectory is clear. The timeline may or may not be. But the hope by default changes. That doesn't mean the hope disappears. And what we have seen in our patients and our families is an incredible resiliency. What they hope for changes. It doesn't disappear. And so we have seen hope to live longer. And that's related to, again, goals of care and comfort care. And we've seen in the research that I've shown that it is possible if you have palliative care at the same time as active treatment. It may be to improve or just maintain a functional equality of life. Maintain independence for as long as possible. That's a hope. You can hope to be comfortable, a realistic hope again. You can hope that your loved one is taken care of. You can hope your loved one has an understanding of what you want. So what I'm trying to say here is that hope doesn't disappear. That hope is an integral part of palliative care and it is something we work with and it's tied into your goal of care. Tell us what you hope for. Tell your family members what you hope for, and that becomes part of our care. As it changes, or as the trajectory of illness advances, the hope changes. Tell us what your new hopes are. That'll change our goals of care. Palliative care is fluid. It doesn't mean the goals of care, or what we talk about the first time we meet, is exactly the same midway. So that's the other thing to keep in mind, is that palliative care is tailored, again, to what your needs are and what your wants are. So I have a big passion in working with families. Um, I'm a family therapist and I, did, I don't think you can nurse a patient without looking at the impact on the family. I'm a big believer in family systems when there is an illness or a diagnosis that the entire system is affected. affected. Um, but I do wanna speak a little bit about family caregivers um, and family members in particular, because I think it's often an you know, the research has shown an understudied or underacknowledged population. Sometimes they've been actually called the hidden patients. If you look at some of the cancer uh, literature, and I would often say in a session with a family member who tells me they don't have time to take care of themselves or their priority isn't themselves. I often say, well, I don't need, we don't need two patients admitted to the hospital. And, and so I want to take some time, first of all, to acknowledge the work that family members do and to highlight some key aspects that I think are important. And the first is that it's a choice. 
and by default, sometimes a necessity. And it's also a commitment with an undetermined timeline. Family members will often say at the beginning, sure, I can do this and take on the responsibility. And sometimes it gets really hard. And so I'd like family members to hear the message that it's okay to say, I'm feeling challenged, or I don't think I can do this, or I don't think I can do this alone because family members do burn out. And the other piece on the flip side is patients think that they've become a burden to their family member as they see family members get more exhausted or more distressed. And that brings me right back to the piece on communication and how do you talk to the patient or how do you talk to your family member and have an honest conversation. And so the implications on caregiving or on caregivers can be huge. They take on responsibilities they may not have been prepared for, giving medications, hygiene, they become taxi drivers, they become grocery shoppers, they become the person who pays all the bills. All of a sudden the roles change and that can be very, very challenging. Not only do roles change, their independence changes, their ability to do things that they used to do before can be compromised. And that comes with a change in family dynamics, particularly when we look at that sandwich generation or younger caregivers who have kids to manage or a parent, patient, uh, you know, a parent to manage. And so that can sometimes be challenging as well. And so my, my message is twofold, one to patients and families to be very aware of this, but also for people in the healthcare profession to be aware of this. We often depend a lot on the family member, sometimes without clarifying or asking if they can take on the responsibilities that we're assigning them. And I think as a caregiver, when you hear a physician say, okay, here's what you need to do, or a nurse say, here's the care plan, and they hand you a list of things you need to do, to be able to, in a moment, take a look at that list and acknowledge what you can and what you cannot do, because there are resources available. And sometimes we need to go back to the goals of care and look at not just what the patient needs, but what the family member needs as well. And so I just wanted to highlight that piece as well in terms of caregivers. The other thing that I wanted um, to mention, and we can just switch to the next slide, when we look at impact, um, is that the diagnosis, as I said, affects everybody. But the key piece on this is that the research actually shows that family members, not patients, have higher levels of anxiety, of distress, and of depression. So we can't overlook the family members. Yes, patients are distressed. Yes, patients can be anxious, but family members actually have higher rates of distress. And that's really key for us to keep in mind as healthcare professionals, we need to be on the lookout. And for patients to take a look at your loved one and say, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? And for the family member to say, holy, this is just too much. You know, we need to talk about it. We need to look at it. Because what happens is caregivers are trying to manage the patient's grief, their sadness, their worries, that they don't find place to put their own on the table. Um, and so I think that's a key piece that I really want to address as well. It's just to be, to be careful with that. So I won't spend too much time on this, but I just wanted to touch a little bit about grief and feeling sad. Um, I am a bereavement therapist and I do work in palliative care. So it, it's by default that I have to put grief on the table. My belief though, is that grief and bereavement don't start at the end of life. And that from the diagnosis on, you start grieving because there's a loss. There's a heaviness that comes with a diagnosis that is chronic like this. And so I think that patients and families are grieving when we meet them. They're grieving the loss of independence, of a healthy life. They're grieving a loss of hopes, of dreams. There's a lot of loss. And so by default, if there's loss, there's sadness and grief. And so this is something else that I just wanted to highlight is to be able to put that on the table as well, to acknowledge that there is a sadness there and that you don't have to feel that there is a happy face that needs to be put on because the sadness and grief is very real and it happens actually right from the point of diagnosis. It can happen with a change in prognosis. It can happen with a change in symptom management or with every new intervention. There is a sadness and a loss that is associated with each of these. And I think it's important that we keep that in mind as well. So one piece that I think, and I speak for healthcare professionals, what we forget is that family members are actually the best advocates for our patients. Patients come into the hospital or into the hospice and we go in with our care plan and we say, here's how it's going to work. And 
family members are the ones who've been looking after the patient up until the point we meet them. And so my belief really is to ask the family members and the patients, and I go right back to goals of care, what, it is that you, what is it that you want? What have you been doing at home that works really well? What can we learn from you? And I know at the residence, that's a priority for us. We really need to make sure that the care you've been giving at home is translated into the care that we are able to provide. So we learn from you. We try to schedule things the way you did. If we do things a little differently, we'll tell you and we'll give you the rationale why. Because the truth is, and the research shows this, and I've seen this, is that family members need to be included. It's not even a question of wanting to be included. Family members need to be included um, at every step of the way related to the patient's care. And you really are the best advocates um, for your patients. And again, that's tied into your ability to communicate with the patient. If you have an open conversation with the patient, you know what they want. And if they can't tell us, then we know that you can. So what does this mean for a family member? Well, talking. And so what that means is say to your loved one what they mean. And this goes both ways, what they've meant to you. Talk about memories. It's a process we call a life review process. Go back and look at things, things that were great, finish unfinished business. And resolving any conflicts, I put it up there, but it's not always possible. And all I mean by that is take an inventory of what's important. The hardest thing when I meet a family member in therapy after they lose someone they love is regret. I wish I could have said this, but I didn't. And so, again, this is not something you need to wait till the end of life for. This is something that starts right from the point of from diagnosis is talking about the relationship you have, your hopes, your dreams, um, regrets, conflicts. These are all things that can be put on the table very early on. Um, and almost need to be put on the table uh, early on in the trajectory and at the appropriate time to be able to say goodbye. And that ties into the slide I had earlier about myths and misconceptions about having to shield children or shield family members from what's going on. Everyone wants that opportunity to talk. Everyone wants the opportunity to say goodbye. And so that's why I put that up there as something important to talk about. So my next slide again is, um, is a quote and I don't know how it translates, but it just speaks to how important or what a privilege it is to be in a caregiver. And it says the capacity to care is the thing that gives life its deepest significance and meaning. And I, and I do believe this. And, and yes, there's a lot of literature on caregiver burden. There's a lot of literature on how difficult it is, but there is a lot of literature on how rewarding it can be um, and how people look back on the experience and talk about how positive it was. And that concept of hope, I promise you, comes through. And so I just wanted to, to highlight the caregiving piece um, and how valuable that is as well. So what I'm hoping you leave today with, um, as, as I end my talk today, are a few things. The first is what palliative care is and what palliative care is not. Because as you've mentioned, and as I've tried to dispute, palliative care is often seen as end of life care and translates into death and dying. While there is a certain truth in that it's often introduced as such, the truth is palliative care is a philosophy of care. And it's a philosophy of care that prioritizes your quality of life. It prioritizes your goals of care and it prioritizes your hope. The other key piece of palliative care is looking at patient and family dynamics and the understanding that we cannot care for the patient in isolation without looking at the family. And that's the other key piece. The taking away from just the physical aspect or the physical care related to an illness is another key piece of palliative care. And the fact that we look at whole person care and we look at what we call total pain or total suffering, meaning yes, there's a physical aspect of your care, but there's a psychological aspect. There's an emotional, psychosocial piece and a spiritual piece of you questioning what's happening to you, of trying to make sense or meaning of what's happening to you that we open up for discussion uh, and hope to address as well. So the key piece or what I'm trying to say is palliative care is not just end of life care. Palliative care is the philosophy that can be implemented right from the point of diagnosis because it means that you are cared for actively and we are preparing along the way to make sure you have optimal quality of life up until the end. That's my talk for today. I'd like to open it up for questions and for discussions.
Thank you very much, Dr. Mehta. Um, so we are open for questions. We are open for comments. Uh, people can do their questions on chat or uh, you have a, on the bottom of your screen something that says reactions. Uh, click on that and that will allow you to raise your hand. Um, and then we will take uh, questions based on that. Is there any, uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes to formulate your questions. Yeah. Don't forget to raise your, to click on the reaction so that I can see um, who's raised their hands. Okay, no question. <laughs> no questions? C'était vraiment clair. That's wonderful. Est-ce qu'on peut poser la question en français? Oui. Oui, je vais essayer le mieux possible de répondre. Si moi, je ne peux pas répondre, il y a un traducteur qui peut m'aider un peu. Je voudrais savoir comment c'est possible, comment ça s'organise, les soins palliatifs à la maison. OK. Donc, je pense qu'on a une présentation tout de suite après ça pour expliquer les services, les services de, de, la, de la résidence. OK. C'est ça, OK? OK. Is there... I think the question was, sorry, I think the question was how palliative care is provided in the home. Oh, I thought, I thought they said la résidence. Okay, no. excuse me. Okay. Um, I don't know what part of, est-ce que ça va si j'explique ça en anglais, puis il y a quelqu'un qui va traduire mes réponses? Just one second. Uh, Monsieur Lecour, est-ce que vous êtes sur l'interprétation dans les le choses en français? Parce qu'il y a une interprétation, un interpréteur qui parle en français. Si vous allez uh, en bas de votre écran, il y a un uh, bouton qui dit interprétation, paye sur ça. Et puis, uh, uh, il y a French ou English, paye sur French ou français. Est-ce que, est que vous avez trouvé ça, Monsieur Le Coeur? Pardon? Est-ce que vous êtes sur une tablette ou un ordinateur? Sur un ordinateur. Donc, d'accord. Donc, en bas de votre écran, il y a plusieurs oui. icônes. Il y a oui. une des icônes qui va dire interprétation. Oui. Paye sur ça. Et je suis sur euh, French. Là. Oui. Donc, ça veut dire que euh, vous entendez le traducteur. Donc, vous avez entendu un homme qui parle. Oui. oui. OK. Parfait. C'est ça. Donc, euh, euh, Dr. Meta va répondre à votre question en anglais et M. Lepage va traduire ça en français. C'est beau. C'est bon. Est-ce que ça va? OK. Donc, si je comprends bien, c'est à la maison que pose une question. Ce n'est pas la résidence soin palliative. OK. Oui. So, depending on where you live, um, there are several CLSCs that have home care services. There's also the Victorian Order of Nurses um, and uh, NOVA. So there are home care services that specialize in end of life care. And so what that means is they will come in and do an assessment and they will ask again what your goals of care are and they will look at how much your family member can provide for you. And so things like hospital beds, uh, medications, home visits are all uh, included in terms of the care that you need. And so the first goal of care is to try as much as possible to have you stay at home if that is what you want. I can't speak to each different service except to tell you that each one has a specialized program for home care. And so depending on which, which service you receive, the first thing they will do is do an assessment and ask what it is that you need. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to read up the La Ville de Quebec. Excuse-moi, Monsieur Le Coeur, euh, euh, vous avez une autre question? C'est un complément de question. Est-ce que les services de soins palliatifs à domicile existent dans la ville de Québec? Oui. Oui. OK. Um, I'm just going to read. Uh, somebody asked if the presentation will be available later. It will be on our website uh, within a couple of weeks at maximum. Uh, all of our conferences are recorded and shared with, the, uh, with our population after uh, we have a conference. Um, we have another question uh, from uh, Diane Tekalek. How do you start or get connected to active palliative care when you have ALS? Okay, so most, uh, 
diagnosis happens in hospital. Most hospitals have, at least I'm thinking of all our teaching ones here in Montreal, have a palliative care uh, team. And so the referral to the palliative care team can come from your treating team. And again, what they do is they look at where you are in the trajectory uh, and what needs they can meet. So a consult needs to be put in by your treating team. Why it's not often done is because we're fighting really hard to put palliative care in right away at the point of diagnosis. And so that's not something that sometimes active uh, treating teams recognize. And so that's part of being an advocate and saying, I'd like a consult, or I'd like to be able to meet with, uh, with the palliative care team. And so part of it is patients having to be active uh, in asking for that, because the focus is very much on treatment, 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 depending on your team. And so um, most hospitals do have uh, a palliative care team, at least all the ones that I'm familiar with. It's just a question of having a consult done up to flag, um, flag your need. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from uh, Nathalie Beauchemin. It's in French, so I'll read it in French. Quelle est votre position quand à l'aide médicale à mourir? Quelles sont les conditions d'acceptation dans le cas de SLA? So what is your position on uh, medical aid in dying and the conditions um, accept, for to be accepted in the case of a ALS? Okay, so that's a very personal question. Um, so I, I will respond to that from a personal perspective. So not, I'm not speaking in terms of uh, what the residents might suggest or not, but medical aid in dying um, has opened a new door in terms of patient autonomy, patient choice and decision-making at the end of life. That being said, it doesn't fall under palliative care because it falls under that concept. If you remember my definition of palliative care saying it doesn't hasten or postpone death. Medical aid in dying obviously hastens death. So it's not seen as palliative care. And there is a huge debate around that. I go back to when you ask for my opinion to patient choice. Um, there is a thorough evaluation done, a psychosocial evaluation done. You were asking about the process, assessing the patient, asking what their needs are, what their motivation is. Um, and so that is done. And then there's a follow-up assessment done as well. And the patient needs to be able to still at that point articulate that these, this is the choice that they're making. If they cannot, then they will not proceed. And so it has to be done at a point where the patient is still able to communicate and articulate what they want. Um, and that's just the way it's set up now, which can be challenging um, in terms of if there's a change in cognition or ability to respond, if the patient cannot reiterate and have that assessment done, then the decision of the first meeting doesn't count. It has to be the, the two meetings. At least that's the process the way it is now. The other key piece that's often overlooked um, that I saw in psychosocial oncology is an assessment is done of the patient. They forget to ask the family members and there's often been distress when the family member doesn't agree with the decision medical aid in dying. And so when a patient decides that, my suggestion is to really have a conversation with your family members to explain your rationale um, so that they understand it as well because there's a lot of distress that's created when the patient chooses and the family member does not. So I don't know if that answers the question, but you asked for my position. So my position is the bottom line is patient autonomy and decision-making, but to just point out that it doesn't fall under the umbrella of palliative care because of what the philosophy of palliative care is. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, does anybody else have a, a question or a comment to, to share? If, if it's not the case, then I'm going to ask Lee if you can set up the second presentation so that uh, Dr. Mehta can um, uh, share what uh, her organization offers, uh, the uh, Teresa de la Palliative Care Residence. So it's for you, Dr. Mehta, again. Okay. And yeah, I apologize for that. The phone. So, um, the Teresa Deller Palliative Care Residence is located in the West Island in Kirkland, uh, Montreal. And so I'm going to speak a little bit about what we do and what the services are. So this is just a picture of the outside. Uh, we took one in the summer where the flowers and the gardens are, are beautiful. Okay. So I think the key piece to understand is what our philosophy is related to, uh, to palliative care. And it's really, Again, we don't hasten or postpone death. We don't add days to life, but we certainly do add life to days. 
And so that's putting, again, the focus on quality of life. Um, and what I put here is, is what our philosophy is. The residence provides compassionate care for terminally ill uh, patients, regardless of what their diagnosis is. With uh, a focus on dignity, we try to create a home-like environment as much as possible. Families are welcome to come. Uh, and that's really one of our goals. Our goal is that the patients and their families can live the final chapter of their lives in the most comfortable and fulfilling manner possible. We are a multidisciplinary facility. So we have physicians, nurses, social workers, our art therapist. Uh, we also have a music therapist that just recently started. And we have amazing volunteers that, uh, that are part of our team, uh, as well as a chaplain that comes in uh, and again, we're very um, conscious of multiculturalism as well, and we make it a point to respect whatever, uh, whatever your last uh, wishes um, and desires are at the residence. We're not a huge facility. Uh, we have 23 beds, um, and we are the largest freestanding palliative care unit uh, in uh, palliative care residence, sorry, um, in Canada. Um, we receive funding partially from government, but mostly through fundraising. Uh, so we are private in that sense. Um, and so there's a lot of work done behind the scenes in terms of fundraising, but the services are free for, for families and for patients. Um, we have had over 4,800 um, uh, patients that have come in and 19,000 family members since the beginning um, of when we started. We've had a range of different uh, ages as well. The youngest paying 18 and the oldest 105. Uh, again, I stress the multicultural aspect of it, you know, 18 different languages spoken by our volunteers and our staff. So we really try as much as possible to offer tailored care. So our mission is to provide active and compassionate care in order to comfort and support um, terminally ill patients and their loved ones, and to continue being a leader in palliative care, uh, not just in Quebec, but uh, in Canada as well. I've just put up a range of the services um, for those who would be interested. And there's a range of them. We have an active psychosocial team that will uh, look at things such as anxiety management or distress uh, at the end of life. Pain management uh, and symptom control is a focus. We have an art therapist and a music therapist. There is family support and bereavement support, not just during the, um, the stay there, but there's follow-up bereavement groups and calls that are made to make sure family members are coping. Um, families are allowed to sleep over. Of course, in the context of COVID, we've had to really adjust our visitors policy, which has been very difficult. So during this period, we have been limiting um, hours for visits and number of people that can be in. Um, but as the, post as the patient um, gets closer to end of life, we do uh, allow family members to stay overnight as well. There's a children's room, there's flowers everywhere. Kitchen services are again now just available for patients. Um, if COVID wasn't something we were coping with then family members as well could have access to, uh, to our meals as well for a very nominal fee. So who, who can we uh, take care of at the palliative care residence? Usually when there is a less than three months prognosis and prognosis is sometimes hard to, hard to guess. And so this is usually what we, what we look at. It doesn't mean patients haven't come in with longer or shorter prognosis at all. The diagnosis or the primary diagnosis has to be terminal. So the patients at the terminal phase of their illness, uh, 18, we're not a pediatric center. So we do look at age and 18 being the youngest. Um, we get referrals from hospitals, from home care. Um, so anyone can really refer. And so the other key piece I talked about earlier is that we're not restricted just to oncology or to cancer patients, but we can have uh, any diagnosis. Cancer is the majority though of what we do see. I think it's about 76% of all our admissions, um, but we do see uh, a range of different diagnoses and populations at the residence and we are equipped to, uh, to care for all. And so I had talked uh, when I gave the talk on palliative care and how important it is to have a team that's dedicated to end of life care. And so we have a team of professional staff as well as volunteers who are all trained. Um, that's part of my role as director of education to make sure that the training of the staff uh, is consistent with the philosophy of palliative care that I've talked about today. Um, they're available 24-7 uh, in terms of access to the care that you might need. Uh, and same with the nursing uh, team. And we have about, as I said, 300 volunteers um, that really support to work, uh, to work towards optimal end of life care. So that's just a little bit about the Teresa Delar palliative care residence. Um, I could talk at length 
in terms of the services that we provide, but I just wanted to give you a general idea of, of who we are and, and where I work and what some of the services are. Thank you very much, uh, very much appreciated. We have with us as well today, uh, Veronique Desprez, who is a, um, she's the Directress of Client Services, I believe, at um, uh, the St. Raphael uh, Palliative Care Center. Um, Veronique is going to give a, a short presentation about the services that uh, St. Raphael also gives. So welcome, uh, um, welcome uh, Veronique. Uh, do you mind to unmute your, um, I don't Am I still it. muted? Uh, no, you're not. Perfect. Thank okay. you very much. I just didn't see you on the screen. <laughs> no, no, it's good. good. Voice. So take it away, Veronique. Everybody, um, so I'm I'm Veronique. I um, I uh, work at Saint Raphael. So I am a director of uh, multidisciplinary services, but I'm also a social worker by by trade. Um, and today I'm here to specifically talk about uh, our services from the day center. So, uh, as some of you may know, we also have a hospice with uh, 12 beds. Um, but today I'm going <laughs> to focus more on, uh, on the day center. Um, so the, in, in, uh, just to, to, um, just to specify before I, I begin talking about our services and what we do here, um, and, and by the way, is it better that I speak in English or in French? I'm, I wasn't sure. And we do have a, a, an interpreter who is translating as we speak at this moment. So your words are being oh. uh, translated into French. Okay, perfect. But is the the most of the people speak French or? Um, they could be, but they're already on the French channel. Okay, perfect. Okay, so maybe I'll go from back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll do the franglais. So uh, we uh, we our our clients are are uh, basically uh, pr primarily oncology, but we do um, open to um, all of the palliative care population. Uh, for the ALS specifically, um, we are, we're not well equipped, and actually that's one of the things that we've been trying to work with uh, with, with with you guys, the ALS Society, and with the. Um, the Neuro Institute to um, make sure that we're better equipped to receive um, people that are that have ALS. But we will. But what we we can offer in terms of services right now is for uh, caregivers. So I I, I'm, I I think there are possibly some caregivers in the uh, audience that are are listening. So so for 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 unfortunately for now, <laughs> it's uh, the services that we offer are only for the the caregivers. So if we go to the next slide, so this is Saint Raphael. It's just a little picture of our uh, of our um, of the building. Um, so we have we offer services from Monday to uh, Friday. Um, these are the professionals that we have on site. Um, so they are available five days a week. We have a massage therapist. We have an acupuncture, uh, a music therapist, an art therapist, and we have a social worker. Um, the massage therapist is pretty um, self-explanatory. Uh, Everybody knows what a nice massage can do. Um, the acupuncture has uh, joined our team last fall, and uh, he really works to uh, help manage uh, some of the symptoms that um, either patients or caregivers can um, can feel. So for instance, uh, if somebody is tr having trouble sleeping, um, somebody is struggling with nausea, um, anxiety, uh, acupuncture can be a nice complement to other medical treatments. Uh, the music and the art therapist, uh, so they will do a very wide range of, uh, of services. Um, but primarily, if I could say in, in two different uh, categories, they, um, it can really have a therapeutic effect in terms of helping people use um, either the music or the art to express certain emotions that are uh, more difficult to express with words or even to just internally uh, be able to identify. So just by doing music therapy, it could be helpful to, um, to ident identify 
uh, some emotions that we might be feeling. Um, and the other aspects of, of what their work, um, which is legacy work. Uh, so the legacy work is really um, quite interesting. Uh, again, it could be um, with, uh, with the caregiver um, to be finding a project um, to be working on in either leaving to your children or leaving to um, your spouse, any loved one um, in memory of uh, the person that has the, uh, the illness. Um, and then the social work, so le suivi psychosocial, so that's what the social worker does, um, is primarily giving uh, support uh, throughout, um, throughout the trajectory of care, um, dealing with loss, grieving. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, those are, that's our multidisciplinary team. Um, their intervention can either be done on an individual basis, uh, but it can also be couples, family therapy, and we are, um, with the public health, we are allowed to be starting to give groups, because that was the initial purpose of the day center, was to also give groups and help with the social isolation. Um, but uh, now it's looking like we'll be able to be giving very small groups, so about three to four people at a time. Um, so yeah, so if we go to the next slide, um, we have also activities. So aside from, from, from the individual couple or family um, interventions that the, the team can provide, these are activities that we, uh, we offer periodically during the year. So um, we have a, a creative journal uh, um, activity that is done, that is given uh, on different formats. So we have days of creative uh, journaling that are uh, offered for um, either for um, caregivers or for uh, in terms of our bereavement uh, program. Uh, we have uh, meditative, meditative ooh, that's difficult to say in English, <laughs> marche meditative um, that's offered to uh, caregivers. Um, we have groups of art therapy. Uh, we have gentle yoga. We have support groups that are given every, uh, every week. And we are um, opening a hair salon that we're also going to be uh, giving um, pedicures and manicures. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, we have a therapeutic bath that is also uh, very uh, good for helping with um, some of some uh, pain management or just relaxation. Um, it's a, a bath that is adapted also to um, reduce mobility. So very easy to, to get in and out uh, of the bath. So, um, so yeah, so those are our activities. Um, so these are, these are our, our clients, like I said earlier uh, before. Um, so it could be, and then maybe I'll switch in French here, it'll be easier. Um, donc toute personne atteinte d'une maladie qui, dont l'espérance de vie est limitée et qui est en phase évolutive. Um, les proches aidants, Uh, donc, il faut, il faut que ça soit vraiment des personnes, uh, des proches aidants. Donc, ce n'est pas, comment je pourrais dire, ce n'est pas nécessaire de, uh, que, que la personne uh, atteinte de la maladie soit suivie par le centre de jour de la maison Saint-Raphaël. Donc, le proche aidant peut y aller de, de, de lui-même, mais il faut que ce soit un proche aidant d'une personne qui est atteinte d'une maladie um, dont l'espérance de vie est limitée. Et on a un programme aussi pour les endeuillés. Puis là, c'est vraiment les endeuillés, autant les enfants que, que les adultes. Euh, et donc, euh, mais encore une fois, des endeuillés de personnes dont l'espérance de vie euh, est limitée. Et puis, euh, on se limite forcément, je ne l'ai pas mentionné sur, la, sur la, la vignette, mais forcément, on est limité aux gens qui habitent l'île de Montréal. Donc, Voilà. Comment faire une demande à la Maison Saint-Raphaël? C'est très simple. On a un formulaire qui est disponible sur le site Internet que j'ai mis ici. Euh, le formulaire n'a euh, pas besoin d'être complété par un professionnel de la santé. Euh, 
les gens, tout le monde, ça peut être euh, complété par un professionnel de la santé, mais les gens peuvent se référer eux-mêmes ou simplement en téléphonant. Et euh, généralement, ce qu'on fait, c'est qu'on on, on, on prend un rendez-vous avec vous. Euh, L'objectif, c'est de faire une évaluation en, en, en prenant le rendez-vous pour mieux connaître votre situation puis mieux voir comment on peut vous aider. Et puis, euh, puis voilà, on essaye de vraiment faire ça simple parce qu'on le sait que euh, généralement, quand on fait affaire avec le réseau de la santé, c'est assez complexe. Donc, on veut, euh, on veut que vous ayez des services le plus rapidement possible et que ça se fasse en douceur. Alors, euh, voilà, mes coordonnées. Et puis, euh, c'est ça. Je ne sais pas s'il y a des questions ou je ne sais pas s'il y a une période, <rire> un espace pour des questions, mais... Yeah, the, for sure, there's a, a time for uh, questions. Um, so if we do have any other questions right now, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and ask your question or write your question in the chat box. Um, let's see, something here. Okay, that was from Cindy. Thank you, Cindy, for letting people know to, to unmute or to, to, yes, to unmute. Do we have any questions, uh, any comments uh, uh, for Dr. Mehta or for uh, Véronique Desprez from Saint Raphael? It doesn't appear that way. I will not uh, request that people stay on the conference if you, if you, if we're not uh, have any questions to ask. Est-ce que je peux poser une question à une personne qui est au, euh, sur l'écran? Je vous oui. demander à M. Marc Jutra s'il connaît Mme Claudette Jutra qui est à côté de moi. Vous êtes, votre micro est fermé, M. Jutra. Non, non, je ne connais pas euh, cette dame. Euh, ça dépend des origines. <rire> je veux dire... Euh, de quelle région êtes-vous? Euh, je suis originaire de la région de Victoriaville. Ah. Ben, Claudette, oui. Moi, je descends des deux frères et qui sont arrivés au Québec. Euh, la famille Jutra est arrivée en Nouvelle-France. C'était deux frères qui venaient de, de Nouvelle-France, qui sont installés <rire> dans la région de Québec. C'est possible. Arrivés. C'est possible, possible que l'arbre généalogique, euh, que nos noms soient reliés. C'est possible. Oui. Merci okay. beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. J'ai quelques questions quand même pour le, le sujet. Donc, oui, euh, un peu merci. Merci. Euh, merci. Donc, euh, de Madame Belliveau, est-ce que les soins sont offerts par, pour toutes les régions, si on reste sur le rive euh, sud ou nord? Euh, Madame Belliveau, est-ce que votre question est pour Madame Desprez ou pour Madame euh, Dr. Meta ou c'est juste une question en général? Parce que le service de Saint-Raphaël, c'est pour les gens qui restent sur l'île euh, de Montréal. Euh, je crois pour euh, Thérèse euh, Delage, je ne sais pas c'est quoi leur critère pour le territoire, mais la euh, possibilité pour euh, les soins palliatifs, vous pouvez avoir ça bon, euh, dans tout le territoire de Québec. Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Mazelier, please feel free. Oui, bonjour. Euh, je voulais savoir, est-ce qu'il y a des, des délais des attente pour s'inscrire à une maison de soins palliatifs. Uh, Dr. Mehta, um, is there a, a, a waiting period for um, putting your name in for uh, uh, the residents? It's not usually too long. Um, there is an admissions process. Um, so there is an admissions nurse that will call and do a, a thorough assessment to try to understand what the needs are. Um, and then based on that, and so that's why we talk about as much as possible identifying what the need is sooner than later, um, so that you don't wait last minute to put in the request. And then as the bed is available, the family will get a call. If they're not ready at the time, then they'll get another call when another bed's available. So it's based on your readiness, uh, but yes, also on our need. But the wait, I, I don't have the data, but it's not too long a wait. You're talking about weeks or months. 
Oh, it's not months. No, not at, not at all. A few weeks. A few weeks, maybe. Maybe, maybe a few weeks, maybe less. It really depends on what our turnover um, turnover is. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Massilia. Does anybody else? Uh, oui, est-ce que vous avez une autre question? Je ne sens pas. Il faut vraiment être en fin de vie, donc près de la fin. Um, Dr. Mehta, is it for, uh, you have to be close to the end of life? Les critères, c'est trois mois, prognostic. Uh, mais comme j'avais dit en avant, c'est difficile des fois de, de dire exactement qu'il reste trois mois ou non. So it's really, they'll take a look at the overall picture, symptom management. So it's not just prognosis. That's important. So that's a key piece to keep in mind. Ideally, we see, we say three months, but we certainly have patients coming in with longer than that or less than that. So the three months is a guideline. It's really what type of support does the patient need? What type of symptom management is required? Is the team approached um, something that could be beneficial? So there's a list of criteria that's looked at, not just uh, the prognostic. Thank you very much. If I understand well, there are houses of soins palliative that can be at the time of the month. La fin de vie, on va dire, il y a des maisons comme celle de Véronique Després où on peut aller dans la journée seulement. C'est ça? Um, I, I, oui, je vais laisser uh, 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 Véronique répondre à ça. Et puis après, j'ai une question uh, sur le chat à demander. Et puis après, Madame uh, Dessereau, ça va être à vous. D'accord? Uh, Véronique non. Oui, alors nous, au, euh, à la Maison Saint-Raphaël, comme j'expliquais un petit peu plus tôt, on a, on a deux services. On a une unité de soins euh, pour les personnes qui sont en fin de vie. Qui, donc, on a les mêmes euh, critères que la Maison Carissa Deller, en ce sens qu'on accueille les personnes qui ont un pronostic de moins de trois mois. Mais au-delà au de ça, à, 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 on a aussi un centre de jour et donc, le centre de jour, c'est vraiment pour les gens qui sont encore à la maison euh, et qui ont encore, ils sont encore autonomes, euh, mais qui peuvent recevoir euh, les services de notre, euh, que, je, que je vous ai présenté un peu plus tôt. Donc, euh, mais c'est vraiment pour une population qui, 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 qui sont au courant de leur, euh, leur pronostic et enfin que la maladie, c'est une maladie qui est incurable finalement. Mm -hmm. Voilà. Très bien, merci beaucoup. Merci oui. beaucoup. Euh, Véronique, euh, est-ce que le transport est possible pour les clients du centre de jour? Ça, c'est une question de Mme José Laferrière. C'est une très bonne question. Malheureusement, on n'a pas de transport de disponible. C'est quelque chose qu'on euh, qu qu travaille très fort parce qu'on sait que c'est une problématique à Montréal. Euh, parfois, les gens ont le transport adapté. Mais on sait aussi que le transport adapté, ce n'est pas un, un service qui est, qui est parfait non plus. Euh, donc, c'est ça. Malheureusement, on n'a pas de, de transport. C'est quelque chose à, à développer. C'est quelque chose qu'on est au courant, qui est problématique, puis on essaye de trouver des, des solutions. Merci beaucoup. Madame Dessereau, vous avez une question. Uh, vous devez uh, uh, unmute. Vous êtes muté. Moi, je veux juste savoir, est-ce qu'il y a des coûts associés au service? Pour Dans les le... deux cas, autant la maison que... palliative que le centre de jour. D'accord. Euh, je vais laisser Véronique en premier et Dr. Meta euh, après euh, répondre à cette question. Véronique, are there costs uh, related to um, uh, using the Teresa de la... Uh, non, de Saint-Raphaël. Sorry, confusing <laughs> residence. <laughs> <of you. laughs> Alors non, il n'y a aucun frais. Uh, tout est gratuit. D'accord. Et Dr. Meta, are there costs related uh, to uh, having staying at the uh, Teresa de la uh, Palliative Care Residence? No, there are no costs. Um, there are some medications, though, depending um, that if they are prescribed may cost the family something, uh, but the care is free. And then with the dining room ever opens up after COVID, there's a nominal cost for meals for family members. But other than that, uh, their services, there are no charge. Thank you. Um, okay. Merci. 
Do we have any other questions? Does anybody else uh, have a question or a comment to share? Please use the reaction button and uh, to raise your hand. Otherwise, it's very difficult for me to see um, everybody. It doesn't appear that um, nobody's writing a chat. Ah, uh, Mr. Bastero, Basurto, sorry. Oui? Um, it's difficult, it's just one moment, it's difficult to hear you. Can you come closer to your um, your tablet or, or computer? Uh, oh. C'est mieux comme ça? Maintenant, c'est mieux. Merci beaucoup. Ah, excusez-moi, oui, c'est bon. Euh, c'est ça, c'est pour les gens qui ont posé la question pour les services de euh, soins palliatifs à domicile. J'ai déjà travaillé dans une CLC à la ville de Québec, puis j'ai été en contact avec l'équipe de soins palliatifs. J'ai vu juste comme vous parler un peu de comment ça se passe à domicile. C'est que les personnes qui, qui ont les, les services de CLC à la maison pour les soutiens à domicile, À un moment donné, quand on est proche de la fin de vie ou quand les soins palliatifs sont déjà euh, plus évidents, mettons, pour l'équipe, on fait un transfert de, de, du cas de, de l'équipe euh, euh, l'équipe standard, si vous voulez dire, vers l'équipe des soins palliatifs. L'avantage de faire ce type de transfert de dossier, c'est que l'équipe des soins palliatifs, premièrement, ils ont plus de plus de temps, ils ont plus d'intensité de, de service, ils peuvent aller à la maison plus souvent, puis en plus, ils ont accès aussi à des équipements euh, du gouvernement, mais via les parcs, plus rapidement, puis euh, ils, ont, ils ont le service d'un médecin euh, de famille qui peut se déplacer à domicile. Parce que des fois, les gens qui ont des médecins de famille, puis euh, quand ils ne peuvent plus sortir de la maison, parfois ils vont perdre le service des médecins familiales, Mais si ils sont suivis par l'équipe des soins palliatifs, ils peuvent avoir les services de médecin de famille à la maison. Puis en plus, cette équipe-là va avoir les services d'un intervenant spirituel qui va aider les gens un peu à, à trouver l'essence dans cette partie de la vie, si vous voulez, sans Le particulièrement de de euh, parler nécessairement de, de, de Dieu et de Jésus, mais un peu de n'importe quelle religion, de n'importe quelle façon que la personne peut voir euh, la vie et, au niveau affectif, il va pouvoir comme les accompagner à ce sens-là. Je voulais juste comme faire cette contribution-là pour expliquer comment ça se passe. Et souvent, la prise en charge, c'est assez rapide. Là. Dès qu'on demande un, un transfert de cas vers ce palliatif, ça se passe assez rapidement. Mais eh, comme les autres personnes ont dit, ça prend quand même un certain critère de eh, pronostic, mettons, de moins de trois mois ou de six mois à peu près. Là. Merci beaucoup. De rien. Um, uh... Do we have any other questions? Any other comments? I would like to thank everybody for your presence today. Um, it's very much appreciated that you joined us. Uh, uh, we will be in touch as we organize and plan more conferences for the future. Um, thank you very much, Monsieur Basurto. Um, so I, I wish you all a lovely day, uh, and I do hope the sunshine is shining someplace in Quebec. <laughs> um, so uh, good afternoon to you all, and uh, we shall be in touch. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Merci.